Okay, I have one o'clock. So we're going to go ahead and get started this afternoon. Let's jump right in here. Okay, so the first thing I'd like to talk about is, is uh, just a quick example of some of the issues um, that we're facing with the environment. And this issue relates to the worldwide report card on the state of insects. And this was a compilation of 72 studies that was done in April of 2019. And this compilation highlighted the dreadful state of insect biodiversity in the world, as almost half of the species are rapidly declining and a third are threatened with extinction. So what the worldwide report card showed was that over 40% of insect species are threatened with extinction. Rates of decline in insect groups was 2.5% per year. So just multiply that up and within a decade where we could see some real serious issues. Um, the most affected orders of insects were butterflies, moths, bees, wasps, and dung beetles. And the bees and the dung beetles are very important. Not only are they important pollinators, but the dung beetles also um, clean up a lot of uh, nasty stuff in our environment. Four taxa of aquatic insects are imperiled and have already lost a large proportion of species. And the reason we were worried about uh, aquatic species is because they are a source of food for a lot of our, our native fish species. Insectivores are in parallel decline with insects. So basically um, any creature that eats insects is also in decline because the insects are in decline. So not only uh, our fish that eat aquatic insects, but also birds, reptiles, amphibians, etc. So the bottom line was that habitat loss by conversion to intensive agriculture is the main driver of these declines. Also implicated were agrochemical pollutants, invasive species, and climate change. So we're kind of faced with a lot of things that we really don't have a lot of control over. Climate change, extinctions, habitat loss, intensive agriculture, and the use of pesticides. You know, there are a lot of personal things we can do, but these are overwhelming issues. So um, what we're trying to get across here is, you know, you may feel helpless and like, like there's nothing you can do, but there are some things you can do. And if we, if everybody could do, um, use some of these strategies, we might be in a better place. So, you know, you've probably heard this before, think globally, but act locally. And that's what we're going to address in today's webinar. We're going to talk about some adaption and mitigation strategies that gardeners can use. We're going to talk about turf. We're going to give you some strategies about how to do some natural gardening. We're gonna talk about plants that support beneficial insects. We're gonna talk about water conservation. And we're gonna talk about recycling in the garden. So let's get started with the first topic. Um, and I like to call this rethinking turf, which means specifically less turf. Um, lawns are unnatural, um, and Americans tend to be obsessed with lawns. We like big lawns, we have large properties, and we have machinery where we can go out and just spend a whole afternoon mowing with, with a beer, and everybody's happy. But when it comes right down to it, lawns are something that Mother Nature does not create. Um, if you just let everything go, and people all of a sudden disappeared. Lawns would no longer exist. Um, Mother Nature creates things like meadows, 
prairies, successional fields. And these types of things are ecologically diverse. There are a lot of different plant species in these settings, and as a result, there are a lot of different insects and animals that use these uh, areas. Lawns, lawns are monocultures. Um, basically, what we're doing when we have a lawn is we're maintaining one species, and there's a lot of inputs involved. All of the grasses that are grown in northern New York for lawns, all the turf species are not native. None of them are native. They're all native to Europe. Even Kentucky bluegrass is not native to Kentucky. It's native to Europe. So we're maintaining a monoculture of one species that is not native. And um, in addition to that, there are a lot of other problems with lawns. Um, we mow our lawns, obviously, and as a result, the grass does not flower. Um, there's no flower heads that develop, um, so there's, there's no pollen, there's no food available, and because we keep grass low, there, there's no cover for, for birds and other animals. And think about the inputs that we put into our lawn. Think of the time we spend mowing, the money we spend on equipment, um, gasoline for our mowers and you know a lot of people like a lawn that looks like a golf course and if that's what you like there's a lot of inputs of chemical fertilizers and pesticides to keep that lawn looking perfect. Annually three million tons of fertilizers and six million pounds of pesticides are used on American lawns. And that's because that's what we like. We like to get on our mowers and um, mow for hours, and it's kind of the American way. But now we're finding out this probably isn't the best idea. So what can you do to um, kind of back off on the turf a little bit? You can mow less, and what I mean by mowing less is allow some portions of your property to become natural. Just don't, just don't mow portions. Um, now, if you live in a urban area, a suburban area, a village, you can't just stop mowing your lawn because if you do, somebody's going to be knocking on your door or complaining that you know so and so down the road is not mowing their lawns. Um, but you can allow some of the fringe areas on your property to become more natural. And you can do this right in the backyard where nobody's gonna see what you're up to, so there shouldn't be any complaints. Um, you should always be returning the grass clippings. Grass clippings should not be bagged up or raked up and removed. They need to lay right on top of the grass after you cut, and what'll happen is they'll fall down to that uh, zone between the roots and the soil, and they will decay. And that will add a natural free source of not only nitrogen, but organic matter back to the soil. If you return the clippings, you really shouldn't have to fertilize only once a year because those clippings are gonna add a source of nitrogen. Add clover to your lawn. Now, clover got a bad rap. Um, I'm dating myself, but when I grew up, there was clover in every lawn. I grew up in suburbia. Everybody had perfectly manicured lawns, but they all had clover in them. And what's nice about clover is that it is a legume, which means it has the ability to put nitrogen back into the soil. So the combination of clover and grass is actually an excellent combination because the clover naturally fertilizes the grass. There's no need for chemical fertilizers. Another good thing about clover is that it flowers, and clover flowers are very attractive to, to bees and are a source of not only pollen, but nectar for the bees also. And clovers tends to stay pretty low, and a lot of times when you do mow, those flowers remain behind. They don't get cut off. So um, 
clover is going to add some a lot of positive benefits to your lawn it became a bad guy probably in the 1970s when people decided that lawns should look like golf courses and should not have anything but grass in them or just one species of grass and the agrochemical companies basically said you know if you've got clover in your lawns you have a crappy lawn yeah it's full of weeds and you need to get rid of that clover so we were basically sold a bill of goods um, to eliminate a perfectly natural combination that's found in nature um, we were told that this wasn't good for our lawns so um so add clover now one thing i will say about clover none of the clovers are native either most all clovers are native to europe but at least if you've got some clover in your lawn you've got the benefits of the flowers um, and the nitrogen um, the ability to fix the nitrogen back into the soil that's a typical um, white clover that's found in most lawns Another thing uh, related to turf is that you don't need to irrigate, especially during the summer. Now this year, right now, everybody's lawn is brown. And um, usually it brown out, what we call brown out or summer dormancy. Usually that happens a little bit later in the season. This year it happened early. And lawns are meant to go dormant. When they turn brown, they are not dead. They are just dormant. They shut down because there's not enough water and the temperatures are too high. So a lot of people think, well, if I keep my lawn watered in the summer, it won't, it won't turn brown. If the temperatures get high enough, it will turn brown because the types of grasses that we grow up here are called cool season grasses. They grow best at temperatures between 50 and 70 degrees. When we get up to temperatures like we've been having the past couple weeks, anything above 80, the grass stops growing and it goes dormant. It just kind of says it's too hot, I'm done. And it shuts down for a while. And then when the temperature's cool and we get some more rain, it perks back up again. But there's no reason to irrigate. These grasses are supposed to go dormant and you're just wasting water because if you do get those high temperatures, the water is not gonna prevent the, ground, the grass from turning brown. And this is typical of what we're seeing everywhere. And of course, it's a totally brown lawn and they're watering it. And it's not really gonna do much good. Do not use pesticides or chemical fertilizers. And you know, that, that goes for turf, that goes for gardening, trees, shrubs. Um, you know, we all know the implications of pesticides and a lot of the chemical fertilizers are not good for the environment either. And actually, if you just leave your lawn alone and don't apply a lot of fertilizers, your lawn is actually going to be less attractive to disease and less attractive to insects. Um, whenever I see a disease or insect problem with a lawn, with the exception of grubs, um, it's because the homeowner has over fertilized. You should, you should only be fertilizing your lawn once a year um, in late September to early October. You should put down one pound of nitrogen per thousand square feet. If anything, if you must do something, do that. Otherwise, um, just leave it alone. These regimens of fertilizing two and three times a year um, just make your lawn more susceptible to problems. So that's my, um, that's my spiel on lawn. Now I'd like to move on to some natural practices. Um, and this is really difficult for people to do. Um, you need to allow some of your landscape areas to become kind of messy. Um, and this is really difficult for Americans to do because we've, you know, we've all been told, you know, we have these lawns and they have to be perfectly manicured and our gardens have to be have flowers like soldiers and little rows and everything has to be perfect. But there are a lot of benefits to allowing some areas to go back to a more natural state. And there are benefits to birds, 
pollinators and beneficial insects, benefits to animals, to decomposers, and huge benefits to the soil. So let's look at a few examples. Um, tree snags. Tree snags are, very, are a very important component of the landscape. And what a tree snag is, it's basically a dead tree. Um, if you have dead trees, allow them to stand. Our natural inclination is to be, it's dead, cut it down. Now, obviously, if it's a hazard tree, if it's near a building, near a swing set, a driveway, sidewalk, whatever, you need to remove it. But if it's out in the back of your property where it's not going to come down on anything, if it happens to fall, just leave it alone. Um, there are lots of wildlife benefits to tree snags. Um, they are purchased for birds, including raptors, um, woodpeckers, use dead trees like crazy. Not only are there insects inside of them, but uh, they can make cavities in them that they can nest in. And when those cavities are abandoned, other critters move in and use those cavities. Um, dead trees are excellent overwintering sites for insects. And um, this also provides shelter um, for other insects, not only um, underneath the dead bark, but also in cavities and holes. Organic debris is very important. So basically by organic debris, I mean stuff that's decaying. Logs, twigs, leaf litter, all the junk that falls down onto the ground. Decay is extremely beneficial. Now we, you know, we tend to say, oh, that's a dead log, that's a dead leaf, it has no value. Actually, as these things break down, they are recycled back into the soil and they are food for soil organisms, and they enrich the soil. They, they turn into organic matter, which is very important, and they supply nutrients, especially micronutrients. And when we think of you know, plant nutrients, we think of nitrogen, phosphorus, potassium, but there are a lot of other nutrients um, that aren't as obvious that plants need in very small amounts, things like boron, even chlorine and sodium, plants need these. And these are available from the decay of organic debris. Um, organic debris also, again, provides overwintering sites for insects and for birds. It's estimated that one fifth of all plant and animal species, which is about 6,000 species, depend on dead wood. So dead wood isn't just a thing out there that, that's lying there doing nothing. Um, I read a book recently um, that stated that uh, the, a tree has mo the most to offer to the environment when it dies and is broken down and goes back into the soil. Another thing you can do to be more natural is allow tall grass to grow. Um, this is going to be a good um, place for ground nesting birds, not only for their nests, but um, for shelter. Um, and it provides egg laying sites and overwintering sites for beneficial insects. And the seed heads that develop on grass are going to be beneficial for birds and insects also. The birds will eat the seeds um, and uh, there's a certain amount of pollen that insects can get from those grass seed heads. Another thing you should do is to allow areas of bare ground to exist. This bare ground is a favored nesting site for solitary ground nesting bees. Now, a lot of people get upset when I say ground nesting bees. The type of ground nesting bees I'm talking about are solitary bees. They do not live in colonies. They um, make a nest in holes in the ground, just like, you see, just like you see here, in very compacted, dry soil, bare soil. They lay one egg in each hole, and they're done. They, they leave. These insects do not tend to sting. 
they have the ability to sting, but they aren't like a honeybee or a wasp or a yellow jacket who live in colonies and will defend that colony very aggressively if it's bothered. Bees are a totally different thing. They are not aggressive. Um, and think of the environment um, that you might see at a playground underneath a swing where there's a lot of bare soil and nothing grows. That's the kind of uh, uh, habitat that these ground nesting bees need in order to lay eggs. And we want to encourage these bees because they are beneficial pollinators. Um, honeybees, to heck with honeybees, they aren't even native. Most of the insects that do our pollination are our native ground nesting bees and bumblebees. And we'll get into that a little bit later. Um, so like I said, they're non-stinging and they are beneficial pollinators. Allow flower heads to persist into the winter. Um, these will be utilized by birds and by insects. Um, obviously, you know, don't deadhead flowers, just let them go to seed. Um, the seeds will provide food for birds and they will help to regenerate the plants. So if you've got more of a natural area, um, let those flowers develop seeds and let those seeds drop so you have regeneration for the following year. Um, stems. Um, this is a um, stem of a sunflower. Not only are the seeds attractive to birds, but insects can overwinter and lay their eggs in the stems. The same thing goes with these cattails. And birds will use this cattail fluff um, for, for nesting in the spring. And insects will also use this um, as, as a hiding place. So let's talk a little bit about plants that support beneficial insects. The first thing we always think of is pollinators. And pollinators are not just honeybees and butterflies. In fact, butterflies are very poor pollinators. They just aren't very good at it. But we like them because they're big and they're flashy and they're pretty, which is fine, and, and they are an important part of the environment. But as far as pollination goes, butterflies are pretty low on the list. The, the best um, pollinators are our native bumblebees and our solitary bees. But bumblebees are particularly um, well adapted at pollination for a lot of different reasons. Um, let, me, let me just go back and talk a little bit about bumblebees. Um, everybody knows what a bumblebee is. It's kind of an orange, uh, large, fuzzy bee. Um, they are native, unlike honeybees, which are not native. Um, and there are wild populations of honeybees, and they, they are very good at pollinating too. Um, but they aren't native. Um, they give us honey, so, so that's why we, um, we allow them. They're native to Europe. They were brought over to this country um, during colonization for honey production and to, to bump up um, pollination of, of the mainly uh, old world crops that people were growing here. Bumblebees, um, they don't produce honey. They live in, in hives and colonies. They are very good at pollination for several different reasons. Um, one of the reasons is, is they can come out and begin pollinating and flying around at much lower temperatures than honeybees and other pollinators. For most insects, um, the threshold is 50 degrees. Once it gets above 50 degrees, insect, insects become active and they start going out about their business. Um, but bumblebees can be active at much lower temperatures, as low as 45 degrees. So on those cold, uh, rainy spring days, when other bees and insects are not out doing pollination, the bumblebees are out there doing the job. And they are particularly good at um, pollination because they're generalists. They'll go just to a, they'll go just about to any flower. And they also, um, have an activity that they do called um, buzz pollination. If 
you've ever observed a bumblebee on a flower, once it gets into the flower, it will, it will shake its body and its wings and it'll buzz about and it will create an audible sound of a buzz. And basically what that's doing is that shaking more pollen off of the flower. So they are much more effective at pollinization than other insects. Um, again, our native solitary bees are just as important as bumblebees. Beetles are also pollinators. Now people don't think of beetles as being pollinators. We think of bees and butterflies and that's it. There are many, many dozens and dozens of different native species of beetles that eat pollen and eat nectar. And they climb on flowers to get the food. And as a result, they provide pollination services, as do flies. You wouldn't think of a fly as a pollinator, but there are insects called bee flies that look exactly like bees. And um, they eat pollen and they land on the flowers and uh, pollinization takes place. And there is an example of a bee fly that is not in the bee family, it is in the fly family. It's what's called a bee mimic. It's designed to look like a bee, it doesn't sting, but it does go to flowers and pollinates them. Um, another type of beneficial insect are the predatory insects. When we think of beneficial insects, we always think of pollinators, but there are a lot of insects that are predatory on plant insect pests. For example, lady beetles. Um, lady beetles love aphids. Aphids are a huge problem. They're a major plant pest, but if you have lady beetles in the area, they love to eat the aphids and they will do a great job in keeping aphids under control. That's why you see um, ladybugs being offered. You can buy them for release. Um, and not only will they eat aphids, they'll eat scale insects and white flies and a lot of other different things. And then there are the parasitic insects. Insects that are parasites um, on other plant pests. Um, an example of parasitism would be an insect that lays its eggs on caterpillars. And you can see this right here. This is a wasp fly. She's laying her eggs in a gypsy moth caterpillar. And as the eggs grow and develop, it will eventually kill the caterpillar. So beneficial insects are not just pollinators. They're predatory insects and parasitoid insects. and things that you probably wouldn't think as far as um, being beneficial. So going back to pollinators, let's talk a little bit more about this. Um, why do we need to encourage pollinators in particular? Well, pollinators are what are called keystone species. A large number of other species depend on them for survival. They depend on them for pollination services. It, um, about 80% of our flowering plants require insect pollination. So if the, if the bees are not around, the beneficial pollinators are not around, these plants are not gonna get po pollinated and then we don't have the next generation. If you have an ecosystem where there are abundant pollinators, that is indicative of a healthy ecosystem. Pollination obviously creates a seed that perpetuates the species. And like I said, 80% of our flowering plants and most of our native plants need insects for adequate pollination. When you plant to um, support beneficial insects, you should try to favor native plants. And this is because our native insects, birds and plants all evolved together. Our native birds and insects know how to use native plants as a result of millions of years of evolution. You put a native plant in the environment, other living things recognize it and are able to use it. Um, 
that plant has a purpose within the environment for either food or shelter. Um, if you put a plant in, you know, maybe you smuggle back a plant from Kazakhstan or something um, and set it in our environment, it's just going to sit there. There's really not a lot of things that are going to use it. Um, yes, butterflies and, and um, bees will go to it to get nectar and pollen if it has any. But other than that, it's not really contributing a lot to the environment. So if you're a bird person, if you like birds in the garden, if you have native plants, they attract native insects. And this in turn is going to attract native birds. And there's a reason for this. When birds are nesting, the songbirds, you no know, robins, sparrows, chickadees, uh, cardinals, buntings, all of those birds that we love to see in the spring, 90% of them raise their young on caterpillars. And the caterpillars need native plants to feed on. Many of our native trees are food plants for caterpillars. So the caterpillars need the native plants to eat. If you have the native plants, you'll have the caterpillars. The birds need the caterpillars to feed to their young. So if you have caterpillars, you're going to have the birds. Um, birds like to give their young caterpillars because it's a nice, compact, juicy piece of protein. Birds do not give their young seeds. They do not give them berries or fruit they give them protein in the form of caterpillars. So let's talk a little bit about what types of flowers attract pollinators. There's two families that um, have a shape, a flower shape that's particularly attractive to pollinators. That's the carrot family and the daisy family. So anything in the carrot family has a flower head that looks like this. It's called an umbel, kind of like an upside down umbrella, or what happens to your umbrella when the wind blows and it gets blown inside out. So these are things like parsley, celery, dill, coriander with that umbel flower head. Really the only two around here that we grow that are going to develop flowers are dill and uh, coriander or cilantro. Carrot, parsley, and celery, they're biennials. They won't develop a seed head until their second year, and we always harvest them before that. So throw some dill in the garden, throw some coriander in. Um, flower head shape is very attractive. Another uh, one that's attractive to pollinators is the daisy family. So anything that has that little button in the center with the petals surrounding it, um, that's what's called a composite flower head. And those are things like sunflowers, daisies, dahlias, chrysanthemums, asters. And you know, there's, there's a marigold. And there's our native uh, wildflower, um, New England aster. Now, a lot of these are not native. Certainly dill and cilantro are not native. Marigolds are not native, but they have a flower shape that's very attractive and they offer pollen and nectar to flowers. So what I tell people, you know, when you talk about this idea of, of oh, you know, we should use native plants. Yes, you should try to favor native plants. But not everything in your garden is going to be native. You probably have existing gardens and existing plants on your property. You're not going to go in and tear them all out in favor of native plants. They do offer something. If they have flowers, they probably have pollen and they probably have nectar. So they are offering something. So what I tell people is don't get too hung up on nativism. Um, you know, if you have things in your garden, that are not native, don't feel guilty about it. Don't feel guilty about if planting a favorite plant that's not native. But just try to make the natives um, the majority of the plants within your garden. 
So let's talk a little bit about how to use um, flowers for the most benefit, ways that you're gonna get the most out of these flowering plants. First key is diversity. You should have at least 15 different flowering species in your landscape. Now that may seem like a lot, and I, and I wanna explain that a little bit because I certainly wouldn't want you to um, do a foundation planting at the front of your house with 15 different flowering species because it would be crazy. It would, it would just be too much. When you consider 15 different flowering species, you need to include the trees and shrubs that are already on your property because they are important sources of pollen and nectar for our native plants. So look at those, see what you have. As long as they're native trees, especially native deciduous hardwood trees, um, you're going to have the caterpillars that eat them that are gonna turn into those adult butterflies that everybody likes so much. And, um, and then just put some additional species in, you know, whatever you like native, try to favor native, or, you know, if it's non-native you like, go for it. Um, generally, the more plant diversity you have, the more wildlife diversity you're going to have. Plan for what we call successional blooming. And successional blooming refers to having something in flower during the period when insects are active. So I said earlier, insects tend to be active around 50 degrees. That's kind of the threshold. So basically you want something in flower from about mid-April to mid-October. And there are lots of options. Um, a lot of people think that there aren't things that flower early enough or flower late enough. But our native trees, again, we go back to our native deciduous trees, they often flower very, very early in the season, even before their leaves come out. They aren't obvious about, about it. You can't, you don't see flowers like we think of flowers. They're very boring, um, just little stems. You may notice a little green on the plants, but that is your early source of pollen for insects. Plant flowers in groups. Uh, this is kind of obvious. Insects can see groups of flowers better than a solitary flower. Use species instead of hybrids. I wanna explain this a little bit better. Um, when we um, manipulate plants through breeding, whether it's through traditional crossbreeding or whether it's you know in a laboratory with GMOs or whatever, um, we create what are called hybrids. And a lot of times these hybrids that we create, um, they have characteristics that we want. Bigger flowers, um, more petals, different colors, higher or lower in height. So we're, we're hybridizing, we're breeding to create flowers that we want. The problem is, is when we do this, we often breed out a lot of the characteristics that insects need. So if you just go with a straight species of plant, it's gonna be the, the, you know, the botanically correct historical species. If you get hybrids, um, then you're getting into that area where something may have been bred out of that flower. Um, oftentimes it's the pollen. Um, and, what happens in that situation is that the insect recognizes the plant, they go to the plant in search of pollen to feed on, and they don't find any. So that insect has just wasted a lot of energy going to a flower that has nothing to offer. The same thing goes with double flowers. And double flowers are a big thing now. Um, I don't care what kind of flower there is out there, there is a cultivar that has been created that has what, what are called double flowers. So lots and lots of petals tightly packed into that flower head. And the problem with that is, is that even if there is pollen or nectar in that flower, the petals are so tightly packed that the insect can't get into the flower to get at the nectar or the pollen. So again, the insect wastes a lot of energy 
going to a flower that really has nothing to offer. So we suggest that you go with species. And at the end of the presentation, there's a couple places um, that you can go to that do specialize in just straight species plants. So flowers um, that are attractive, uh, you know, if you want butterflies, if butterflies are your thing, long tubular flowers in red, orange, and yellow. Those hot colors tend to be most attractive to butterflies. Moths, um, and we've got some really cool, super large moths um, that, that even live around here. I mean, they, they can be five, six inches across. Uh, moths obviously prefer night blooming flowers. So things like jimson weed and evening primrose are going to be attractive to moths. And then if you want to attract bees, um, blue flowers are the way to go. Now, obviously, you know, if there's allergies, you don't want to attract bees, so you might want to avoid blue flowers. But, but if you don't have a problem with bees, um, blue flowers are most attractive. They cannot really see red um, with the type of vision that they have. So in addition to um, planting certain types of flowers and planting them in certain ways and using different strategies, habitat is also very important to insects. Um, and you're going to create an insect-friendly habitat if you have less lawn, because you're going to have unkempt areas, natural areas that are going to be beneficial to insects. Don't use pesticides. Um, and you know, we say that over and over again, but the problem is that pesticides, especially insecticides, are not selective. So if you, maybe you notice some aphids or, you know, potato beetles or, or whatever on your plants, if you go out and spray an insecticide, most of the insecticides that the consumer can buy are what, what, what we call broad spectrum insecticides. They aren't going to just kill the aphid or the mealybug or the Japanese beetle. They're going to kill every insect that, that contacts that pesticide. And that includes bees, that includes lady beetles, that includes butterflies and moths. So insecticides are, are not selective. And there's also problems with fungicides. Um, in the past, we used to think, oh, you know, fungicides are not a big deal. They kill fungus. Um, you know, they aren't going to bother insects or anything else. Well, since um, colony collapse disorder, which uh, started about 10 years ago with, uh, with uh, uh, honeybee hives collapsing and, and wild bee hives, hives collapsing, including, including bumblebees, when they have done studies, on these uh, basically dead hives, they have found high amounts of fungicides in the hives in addition to insecticides. So they think there's, you know, fungicides um, could be creating some problems also. Um, everything needs a water source. So if you can provide a source of water in your garden, um, that's going to be helpful to all insects. Um, you can do things like just set out a saucer of water. Um, you can use the, uh, the clay saucers that you put on the bottom of a clay pot. They work really well. Um, butterflies like puddles. They like to get in water and puddle around. Um, also, maybe you, if you find a stone, a piece of shell that's got a depression in it that holds water, you know, that, that's probably a more natural option. But, or a bird bath. Um, you know, you don't want to have huge sources of water sitting around because that's going to um, be an egg-laying site for mosquitoes, but just shallow areas are going to be very beneficial to insects. Provide nesting habitat, and of course you're going to do that if you have, uh, if you've allowed, uh, allowed areas to become a little bit more natural. Um, so you, that bare ground for those harmless ground nesting bees Trees with loose bark, um, trees like shagbark hickory, birches, um, some of the cherries that have kind of an exfoliating loose bark, those places make excellent 
egg-laying sites. They make excellent sites for insects to pupate or form a cocoon. And they also make excellent overwintering sites. And then snags and unkept areas, you know, as we talked about earlier, they provide shelter for insects. Okay, so let's move along to a little bit on water conservation in the garden. Um, nationwide, the watering of lawns and gardens accounts for one third of all residential water use. And probably a lot of that is because we insist on watering our lawns when those lawns should be dormant. Um, that's nine billion gallons per day. And these figures are a couple of years old, so I'm sure it's, it's probably beyond that now. As much as 50% of this water that we put down is lost through evaporation, wind, or runoff. And this is typically what we see. People have yards that they irrigate, but they're not paying attention to where that water's going. It's going into the road, it's going onto sidewalks. It's not really getting to where it needs to be. So let's talk a little bit about um, how to conserve water when you do irrigate. First of all, use a rain gauge. Um, for the past month, our rain gauges have been empty and we know that we need to water at this point. But um, most plants, most uh, flower gardens, most vegetable gardens need about an inch of water per week. The simplest thing to do is to get a rain gauge, Put it out in your garden. If by the end of a week there's not an inch of water in there, then you know you need to water. A lot of times we overwater, and that leads to a whole nother uh, set of issues with our plants. But an inch of water is the rule of thumb. Try to stick with that. Um, water early in the day. If you water early in the day, there's less evaporation. So you use less water. Um, if you can, use drip irrigation or hand water at the base of plants. Um, drip irrigation, I personally, I don't like it because you've got all those hoses laying around and it's a pain to put down every year. I, I fooled around with it for a few years, but I just gave up. Now I just hand water at the base of plants. So either use a watering can or a hose, lay the hose at the base of the plants, and walk away for about 10 minutes, especially like on shrubs and large perennials. Um, or use, or like I said, use a watering can, make sure the water goes at the base of the plants so it penetrates down in the soil. You don't need to sprinkle the water on the top of the plants. That really does nothing and it's gonna evaporate and you're gonna lose a lot of it um, rather than having it go down into the roots. Yes, hand watering is more labor intensive. Um, but um, you know, hose works just as well, and you can lay that down and go do some weeding while it's it's uh, while it's watering. You want to apply the water slowly because you want it to penetrate down into the ground. You don't want it to just sprinkle the surface and run off because if you um, if you allow that water to penetrate down into the ground, it encourages the roots to grow down into the ground rather than stay at the surface. And if those roots are moving down into the ground, they're gonna be more protected, um, not only from people walking around from weeding, but also from any drought. If those, the deeper those roots are in the soil, the more water there's gonna be. And if those roots are encouraged to just stay near the surface, they're gonna dry out a lot more quickly that week that you're on vacation and not able to water. Um, again, you know, don't water lawns during summer dormancy. And if you can, collect rainwater in rain barrels or cisterns. If you have gutters on your house and you have gardens, you are lucky because you can just collect all that water from your roof just think of the surface area of a roof and how much water is shed from a roof in a rainstorm. If you can run those gutter uh, downspouts into some type of rain barrel, you are gonna have a constant source of water throughout the season, except for maybe this season, unless you started in the spring and, and you saved it up. 
Um, let's talk a little bit about runoff and erosion, which are huge problems. Um, you should try to keep soil covered. Yes, I spoke earlier about having bare patches for uh, those solitary bees. These are just small patches. If you have large patches of soil, you need to keep them covered. So if you've harvested maybe your peas and you've got an empty space there, put something in there, either another vegetable or, or put a cover crop in there. Put, put some uh, annual uh, perennial ryegrass in there or annual ryegrass in there just so the ground is covered. That's going to prevent the erosion. Um, use bioswales. If you have areas where um, there's a lot of runoff, maybe low-lying areas um, throughout your property where water accumulates or runs off, um, plant those areas um, with plants that will tolerate frequently flooded areas. Um, and you could do that by building a rain garden. Um, you just, you can plant in areas that are naturally wet or you can direct runoff to these gardens. And basically they're low-lying areas. You can put berms around them and you plant them with moisture tolerant plants with deep root systems. And what that does, it kind of mitigates that runoff so you're not losing soil and nutrients. And the plants to a certain extent are gonna take up some of that moisture and, and keep it from maybe laying in the location where the problem is. And you should always, if you have a stream or if you're on the lake or the river or a pond or whatever, you should use natural vegetations as buffers along those riparian or waterways. Um, this is probably sacrilegious for me to say, but you never want mowed lawn growing right up to the edge of a water body. And, but let's face it, that's what we all want. We want to take our Ad Adirondack chair, we want to set it in the grass, and we want to look out at the water and, and have nice mowed grass. We can put our feet in and we don't want any obstructions. Um, that's not the way Mother Nature does it. Mother Nature has lots of plants growing along waterways. And what those do is they filter any runoff before it gets to the waterways. So it's kind of Mother Nature's um, sanitation system. It naturally cleans the water before it gets into our rivers and streams. And you know, that, this is what Mother Nature does. Um, she does not have mowed, mowed grass right up to the water. She has a lot of different plants up to the edge and um, there are a lot of um, reasons why we do that, which, which I just stated. It's just so much better for the environment. And there, you know, and if you, ha if you live along the lake and you don't want a bunch of trees obstructing your view, there are lots of different plants that you can put in that will provide um, erosion and um, runoff um, benefits without having tall plants um, that are going to obstruct your view. So if you're interested in that, just let me know and we can, we can send you a list of plants. And if you can, if, if you are lucky enough where you're maybe on a newer property or you're doing some remodeling, maybe you're putting in a patio or sidewalks, um, try to incorporate porous surfaces. So what I mean by that is rather than paving everything or putting cement down, you can put down things like, um, natural pavers that have holes in them that actually the grass grows up in between and you can create driveways out of this you can create patios and paths out of this so instead of having a solid surface where rain hits and it just runs off um, these poor surfaces are, are much better um, you know think of a stone driveway you know the water is going to infiltrate through that stone into the ground naturally what, rather than a paved or a tar via driveway where the water just lands and then it runs off. And then here's just an example of a waterway, um, a little stream with plants um, getting established along that stream. And as you can see, 
you know, it's not an area that's mowed, it's just a natural area, and that's going to naturally filter that water, any runoff before it hits that stream. Another part of con water conservation is the use of mulch. Um, mulch is great. It holds in moisture, it prevents evaporation, and it moderates temperature. So it's very good for plants, but you have to mulch correctly. Um, also, as mulch breaks down, it adds organic matter back into the soil. That, that is if you use a natural or organic mulch. Obviously, if you use, um, you know, uh, stone or, you know, the recycled tires or whatever, that's not going to add organic matter back into the soil. But things like wood chips, leaves, grass clippings, um, you know, anything that is a natural product, eventually it's going to break down and become beneficial organic matter. Um, so things like shredded bark, wood, leaves, straw, um, can be, and cardboard can be used as mulch. Um, Cardboard is a really cheap option, doesn't look lovely, but um, it will break down through the season. And what I do when I use cardboard is I put uh, bark mulch on top of it, then it doesn't look like I've got a bunch of cardboard laying around my property. Um, use mulch correctly. It should never be piled against stems or trunks. This is what we call volcano mulching, and it basically kills the trees. Um, these trees in this situation are probably going to be dead in a couple of years. Um, and people in my line of work, when we see this, we just point and laugh. Um, we don't know how this became popular. Landscapers continue to do it, even though it's wrong, because that's what the customer wants, and it's killing the trees. So use mulch, it should only be about two or three inches thick, and it should never, ever touch the stems or the trunks of the plants. So a little bit about gardening recycling. Um, first of all, let's talk about recycling nutrients. And you can do that by leaving those grass clippings in place, just like we talked about. In the, le in the fall, don't rake up your leaves and bag them. Run them over with a lawnmower and leave them in place. Again, that's a beneficial source of organic matter that's going to go back into your soil. Compost. Um, if, you, if you have a place, get a compost bin, bin going. It doesn't have to be anything elaborate. And if you compost correctly, you won't have any problems. A lot of people hesitate about creating a compost pile because they think it's going to smell, they think it's going to attract um, critters. If you compost correctly, you, you, you will not have any problems. And if you want more information on composting, I can certainly mail you stuff, but that, that's a whole nother class. But if you can get into composting, you should do it. You should start experimenting with it now because I think in a few years, it's gonna be a requirement. So you can compost yard plant waste, your kitchen plant waste, you can put in your coffee filters, your tea bags, your coffee grounds, eggshells, and that's about it. Don't put anything else in there. Now when I say kitchen plant waste, I don't mean scrape the broccoli off the plates that the kids didn't eat. I mean raw vegetables, vegetable peelings, nothing that's cooked, nothing that has butter or oil on it. Because once you start doing that, that's when you get odors and that's when you get um, critters coming around. And there's a simple compost bin, um, very easy to make out of pallets. There's always pallets laying around side of road places. Um, or you can just make a pile. And that's probably the easiest thing to do in one corner of your garden. Just uh, maybe that unkempt area that you're going to establish. Just create a pile of stuff. Turn it every once in a while, throw some stuff in there. You don't have to be, um, you know, an expert about it. And in a few months, probably, you know, you'll have um, material that you can incorporate back into your garden. Recycle water. And again, we talked about that using rain barrels. Other things you can do in the garden 
Um, you can use newspaper and cardboard as mulch. And take advantage of on-site materials for landscaping. So if you maybe have a source of stone, um, you're cutting down trees, you have logs, um, take advantage of those, incorporate those into the landscape. This is what um, a master gardener did. She created a garden, she used logs as a border, and then just some shale from her property as a path. Um, recycle plastic containers. Use them to start transplants in the spring. Just make sure you poke holes in the bottom so the water can drain freely. Use old cloth as plant ties. Um, old sheets and blankets you can put over plants in the spring and in the fall for frost protection. So there's a lot of things you can do to keep things out of the landfill also. And then of course we, we talked about um, recycling pallets and you, you can use those for all kinds of things. So after all of that, let's just sum everything up. Um, you can be sustainable with gardening. You do have something to contribute. And if we can get more people to get in the habit of doing these things, um, it's gonna go a long way towards solving some of the problems that we do have. So think about mowing less, having less turf, allow some natural or if you wanna call them messy areas to develop. Use native plants to support beneficial insects, but you don't have to be a Nazi about it. If there's something you like that's not native, it's not a big deal. Conserve water, recycle, reuse, and repurpose in the garden. So um, at this point, I'm just gonna go over some of these resources. And then if you have questions, you can type them in the chat and I will go over them individually. But first I wanna talk about some of these resources. Um, there's a book called Bringing Nature Home by Douglas Ptolemy. He is an entomologist from the University of Delaware. And he talks about the whole concept of the birds and the caterpillars, um, that whole process, that, that whole, um, system that works within within our environment. Um, so if you're a bird lover, this is this is a good book to read. Um, Native Plants of the Northeast by Don Leopold. He is a professor at uh, SUNY ESF. Um, this is just going to talk about all of the native plants and it's specific to the Northeast. If you just get a book about native plants, you know, who knows, or any or any just general book about plants it can be from anywhere. Try to find things for the Northeast, New England, um, North Woods, um, titles like that. The Xerxes Society, which is a proponent of all things pollinating, all native insects, um, they put out a pollination conservation handbook, which you can order through them at xerces.org. has a lot of good information about our native pollinating insects. And if you want to know if something is native or not, you can go to the New York Flora Atlas at that website. And um, that will tell you about plant species, how to, identify, how to identify them, what their characteristics are, and more importantly, you know, if they're native or not. Okay, so I am going to Check out the chat here and see. Well, there's nothing in the chat. So apparently nobody has any questions. I'm gonna give this a few more minutes for um, folks to type in. And of course, if you get questions later, you think of something later, you can always contact me here at Cooperative Extension. I don't know if I have that. That actually should be on my, uh, it is on the screen. It's hiding. There it is. You can contact me at that email address um, or at that phone number. Um, we are in and out of the office due to COVID. Um, some weeks I'm here, some weeks I'm working from home. 
But if you try to contact me with either one of those um, email or the phone, I will get back to you. Just, just want to point out. Sorry, we're having an announcement here at our office. Thank you. Okay, the announcement is over. Um, just want to point out that this in my email, that is a J. A lot of people think it's an I. Send it with an I, I won't get it. That is a J. Okay, let's, let's go through here and see what we've got for questions. We have from Lindsay. She's asking about diatomaceous earth. Is it a good organic pesticide and how should it be used? Diatomaceous earth is good. Um, it's especially good on soft bodied insects. So if you're having problems with snails and slugs, if you sprinkle that around the base of the plants, they won't crawl through it because it's very sharp and it will, it will cut up their bodies. Um, really, other than that, it doesn't really work for other insects because other insects can fly or crawl and they don't have soft bodies. So it doesn't really bother them. Um, if you do get diatomaceous earth, you should get horticultural diatomaceous earth. Um, there are two different kinds. One type is used for swimming pool filters, and then there's the horticultural type. Apparently, there may be some issues with um, the dust from the pool, um, diatomaceous earth. You know, there may be some issues breathing it. So look for the horticultural grade, and you're probably going to have to go online for that. Let's see. Um, Kate says, how to maintain seven acres. High ground and low ground. The lower level is along a river. Well, that's that's seven acres is a lot, and I know because I have I have about seven acres of property. Um, what I would do first, Kate, if I were you, is I would make a survey of what you've got on the property. Um, is it all mowed, or are there some natural areas? Are there trees? Are there shrubs, wildflowers? Make a list of what's there. Um, and then contact me and I can work with you individually on that because that's, that's a huge amount of information to go into right now. So um, see what's there and then contact me. Let's see, it's at the base is extremely wet. She's combating invasive species. <coughs> so that's what, yeah, I need, to, I need to know what invasive species you're combating, okay? Because that, that's gonna help me determine what would be good to plant. You've got to get those under control first. Um, there are a lot of good plants for wet locations that we can suggest. And you know, if you're in Jefferson County, I could certainly come out and do a site visit to get a better idea. So contact me, um, either email me or call me and we'll, we'll put something together. Okay. Well, if there's nothing else, no other questions, um, I want to thank everybody for coming today. And um, let's, let's hope that we get some rain tonight because we really need it. And um, we really um, need some cooler temperatures also. So thank you for coming. And if you have any questions, you know where to find me.